Hi folks, my name is Adam and I like to make tiny nerdy things. And I love me a little desktop bonsai tree. However, I don't have a green thumb and everything I touch turns to dust. What I do have though is a copious amount of clay. Uh, and aluminium foil, I guess. Or if you'd rather, aluminum, aka freedom foil. Now all the best bonsai trees need a little rock to rest on and I'm gonna make mine by wrapping some foil in a thick layer of clay. Of course, this leaves me with a rather gray looking potato, but it's easy enough to turn this into a rock by adding some little lumps of clay all about its starchy body until it's a bit less uniformly smooth, at which point I can introduce the best rock texturing tool I own, a rock. Now you may be wondering why I'm using a rock to make a rock as a base when I could just use that rock for the base, to which I'd say, Obviously that rock is too small and I need a bigger one which I don't have on hand. Also, shut up Dave, no one asked you. Now once I've hardened my rock in the oven, it's rock hard and ready to be drilled into. A couple holes in the top side will support a couple thick lengths of armature wire which will be the trunk of my tree. I'll then twist this trunk around for a while, adding and removing lengths of wire somewhat willy nilly until I finally settle on a shape I want for my tree. My original idea was to have an exaggerated curve with a big bushy canopy on top, but eventually I decided that a less foliagey tree might look a little bit better. In reality, the size and shape of my tree is very much decided by the internal dimensions of my oven. However, I eventually settled on a shape so I can start the unwrapping process, which involves bulking out the body of the tree with lots of aluminium foil. Once I've wrapped the limbs and trunk in their entirety, I can then change my mind again about the shape, shaping it into what will finally be the final shape. Of course, with that sorted, it's time to start adding the bark. I don't actually have any brown wood-colored clay left over, but I do seem to have an excess of this extremely light flesh-toned clay that should serve the same purpose. After all, there's plenty of light-colored trees out there, and we can always fix it later with a little paint. Once I've got the foil fully covered in a thin layer of fleshy clay, I can start adding the roots along the bottom by sticking some thick wormy dealies along the base of the tree, worming their way upwards. Now all good trees have a hollow in the front which, in fleshy tones, is perhaps a touch too suggestive. So let's spin to the backside and add some more worms before this channel gets demonetized. Finally, some lumps and gnarly bits can be added around the rest of the tree to make it look nice and old, and I can fill in the rest of the blank spaces with some more worms worming their way along the trunk. I figured old gnarled bark has sort of a veiny appearance, so it's sort of what I'm going for here. Veins and arteries and other noodly accoutrements. Now my tree has a handful of limbs that are reaching up towards the sky, and I find with old gnarled trees, the branches end up looking sort of like hands with wonky gnarled fingers, so much like the veiny bits running along the body, I'm gonna use that as inspiration. Otherwise, it's about time we made some eyeballs for the tree, which I'm gonna make using these little guys here. These are cabachons or cabochons, if you prefer your words to be pronounced correctly, and they're usually used to make jewelry. However, once I picked out a few choice sizes, I'm going to attach them dome down to a strip of painter's tape, then apply a single tiny dot to the center. I'll then follow this up by painting some strips of lighter colors from the center outwards, followed by a thick stippling of darker colors to completely cover the backside. Then, once the paints had time to dry, I can peel them off and admire the beautiful eyeball iris we're left with. Finally, I'll smoosh a little ball of white clay onto a baking tray and press the cabochon iris into the middle and clean up the edges, leaving me with a wonderfully detailed eyeball. Then, it's just a case of repeating this process with the rest of my glassy domes until I've got a tray full of eyeballs ready to be baked. Before I do that though, I need to make some teeth for my tree, obviously, so a quick pinch, pull, and press will give me a tray full of teeth. And once my eyeball and teeth tray's been baked, I can peel the eyeball off the tray and press it into place on some pre-prepared eyeball holes. All that's left to do then is fit the rest of my lovely glassy eyeballs around my tree until the entire body is covered in naturally occurring bonsai eyeballs. I can then move on to the enteethening, jamming all the little teeth that I made alongside the eyeballs into the various alcoves and hollows and holes that are scattered around the body of the tree. 
I then decided to add some eyelids to at least half the eyeballs so they don't all look so wide-eyed. I want this to be an old gnarled bonsai, so I think that by adding some lids to some of the eyes, it'll at least help to add a little bit of realism so, at a glance, you might be tricked into thinking that this is actually a real tree. Sticking with that old gnarled look, I poked a few divots then filled them in with little balls of clay to create some old age pustules before going back to the limbs to add some final detail to the fingers. This mostly involved adding the knuckles so they're more obviously fingers as well as adding some fingernails to the larger limbs and lots of wrinkles along the skin to help add that last bit of realism. Once the topside fingers have been finished, I can move down to the roots where I'll start to lengthen the noodly bits and cut some extra digits into several of the limbs, turning them into little fingers. I'll also be sure to leave some of the larger roots intact, so there's a natural mixture of toes amongst the roots as well. Otherwise, that's the majority of my bonsai tree sculpted, which means it's finally time for some alcohol. Using a well-used brush, I can brush the alcohol over the entire surface of the tree, smoothing the sharper lines out and blending some of the rougher joints together, as well as imparting a tiny bit of brushed base texturing over the entire surface. Additionally, it'll soften the clay and remove any fingerprints, which would ruin the otherwise realistic appearance of my tree. Once I've smoothed the body of the tree out, I can add the final veins and arteries by attaching some extra long, extra noodly noodles of purple clay. The blue nitrile gloves will help keep me from accidentally pressing fingerprints into the already smoothed clay, as well as add some extra texture a little later. For now though, I'll drape my purple noodles across the length of the tree, adding a little offshoots here and there before blending the tips in and adding some final rolly surface texture. As I mentioned mere moments ago, these gloves have a tiny bit of texture on the tips of the fingers that works wonders for applying a somewhat pory look to the surface of a fleshy model. Because the clay is already soft from the alcohol, all I need to do is aggressively fondle my bonsai tree to impart the texture. Then it's into the oven to bake and I can get to adding some color. However, before I do that, I'll protect the eyeballs by covering them in a layer of museum putty. Now as far as the color of my tree, it's already got a pretty good pale flesh flesh tone, but I want to increase the contrast and add some shading, so we'll apply an initial layer of darker pink over the entire body, followed by a couple layers of progressively lighter pinks. I mix the paints with a fair amount of retarder so that they won't dry too quickly, which means I'll be able to blend each of the lighter coats into the darker base coat to create a smooth blend between the shades. Once the top coat's cured properly, I can paint the inside of the mouths with a couple coats of reds and terracottas, and to help the thicker veins stand out, I'll coat a little makeup sponge in alcohol and gently rub away the top coat of pink, revealing the lovely purpley clay beneath. Now at this point the tree is looking pretty good, but it's still a bit too light, so I'm going to see if I can't make it look a little bit more natural by mixing myself up a lovely little all-over red wash. To make this wash extra washy, I'll mix up some matte medium, some flow improver, a fair amount of water, and just a mosquito's fart worth of red ink. I'll then paint this liberally over the entire surface. Ideally, this will tint the surface layer but flow down into the recesses on account of the reduced surface tension thanks to the flow improver. A quick blast of the heat gun on the lowest setting will pop all the bubbles and once it's dried I can give everything a last light pink sponging to bring back some of the sharper details on the edges. Otherwise it's on to painting the teeth which will get an initial base coat of bone white followed by a wet blending with bright white to create a clean gradient. Finally my bonsai tree's a bit flat so I'll give the whole thing a blast with a semi-gloss varnish to give it a slightly wetter surface appearance. Then I can peel the sticky tack off the eyeballs and admire the beauty of this beautiful bonsai tree. All that's left to do then is clean up the rock a bit to remove the red and pink that spilled down from the tree's roots. An initial unifying grey top coat followed by a blackish brownish wash to add some shading and a couple coats of progressively lighter grey dry brushings will get it back to looking like a rock. Otherwise that's my clay tree looking nearly indistinguishable from a real bonsai tree. What would really seal the deal on the authenticity though is if I had one of those ceramic bonsai planters to sit this tree inside. Of course, I don't have one of those planters. What I do have though is one of these awful plastic pots from the last time I ordered Thai food. And with a little XPS foam, I think we can make do. I'll start by attaching the plastic pot to the foam with a little dab of hot glue, then I can fill in the gaps with some modeling paste. 
I'll smear this all over the sides of the plastic pot and into the gap between the foam base and the pot, trying to get at least a semi-smooth transition between the two of them. I'll fill the lip of the pot where the lid would sit so it's a solid piece, then I'll bulk out the sides so they look less like plastic and more like intentionally wonky ceramic. Once it's had a chance to harden, I'll sand the most egregious parts flat, though I actually think the gaps and imperfections help to sell the final look. Otherwise, I'll mix up a little black paint and some high gloss varnish and give the entire planter a thick black coat. Once that's dry, I'll pad the inside with some packing paper and a layer of foil to keep it all together and I can fit my tree on top. Last but not least, I've got some of this fake moss from a Christmas wreath that I've repurposed which will be a perfect filling for the space around the base of the tree. And with that, I'd say we're all done here and onto the glamour shots. As always, a big old thank you to the fine folk over on Patreon, and a special hey how are you to my newest patrons, Samantha Bodgers, DLX183, Eden from Gothic Jewels, Marday the Great, Lucius Kane, Athena Pinky, Oni Bread, Adam McPhee, Kate Wolf, It's Amanda Kate, Sheena Warren, Lori Lomont, Chai and Pico the Cats, Sujesh Thompson, Earl Grey Warden, Dan, Monica, Scout, Golden MW, Matthew Aris, Kareen Gagne Klepak, Alex, Kunga Del Rey, Appreciate Han Brolo, A Beef Salad, Lady Shackdaw, Darren Shea, Dirge Nerder, Travis Neller, Stories from Central Burke, Buncho Daddy, Master Roca, Paulo, Tau X Legion, Blaine and Hannah, Zombie Cat, Nick Nichols, Dom, Rob, Captain Tim, and Amore Quack, and McGiggletits Madden 23. You are the multiple beautiful eyeballs littered about this entirely normal bonsai tree. If you like this video, then seek help immediately. Otherwise, we'll uh, see you next time. Cheers.